Uh, thanks, Rob and Peter, for the information to talk to you today. Um, for those who don't know, the BITRE is the analytical and statistical arm of the Australian Government uh, Department of Infrastructure and Regional Development, and we've been around for about 40 years now. Um, I've been asked to talk largely about the size of the trade task. Uh, what I'll do is I've got a presentation that's sort of in two parts. So the first part, I'll give an overview of the trends in the freight task. Uh, where we think we're going. And the second part is I want to provide a bit of an overview of some work we're doing together with the Australian Bureau of Statistics to investigate alternative sources of uh, freight data, uh, particularly at the moment we're looking at uh, in with telematics data to provide uh, data that we otherwise have tried to collect through um, paper based sample surveys. So, just in um, just to give you some sort of headline figures. Um, the domestic freight task in 2013-14 totaled approximately 700 billion tonne kilometres. Rail accounted for over 50% of this. Uh, nearest we would work out about 55% of this. A lot of that is iron ore and coal, um, going direct from mines straight out of the ports. I've got a graphic later on that shows some of that. Road transport accounts for about 30% of the task and coastal sea freight. It's just missing up. It's close to the sea freight about 15% of the past. Um, trade is very important to Australia. Um, so, total merchandise trade of uh, so total about 67 billion um, in 2013 14. So, um, together, imports and exports uh, were approximately 42% of GDP. Uh, you can see Australia's ports handled approximately. 1.13 billion tonnes of freight in 2012-13. Um, um, and you see the vast imbalance in volumetric terms. Um, our exports are about a billion and imports are about 140 million tonnes. And containerised trade across all ports in Australia around about 7.2 million TUs. Uh, this graph equally um, just gives you a stylistic overview of uh, the Australian freight task. <coughs> So the red is rail, um, and uh, the size of the lines shows the um, sort of the tonne kilometre task. So you can see the importance of iron ore and coal um, in the rail freight task. Elsewhere it's important, east west, I'm probably telling you, you know, things you already know. Um, but it only carries a very small share of other capital freight. Road is the dominant mode for Right between most of Australia's capital cities and between sort of other urban centres. And also, it's practically the only mode, apart from a bit of a more subtle urban in some of the capital cities, the only mode for freight in our cities. Um, coastal shipping task, <coughs> this slide's a little bit old, but it's actually dominated by the three trades. Bauxite, you can see about 25% of the, the freight task back in 2011. Well, it's just moving bauxite from Wheatley down to Basin, where we mine into Olympia and aluminium. Um, and the other place is important because um, further more around the coast from uh, the northwest shelf and a little bit of the east west trade. But again, that's um, some of that <coughs> um, aluminium or aluminium moving around the coast from, from um, sort of Perth, Bunbury. Excuse me. Yeah. Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, sorry. Sorry, is that better? So I have to, have to get it closer. Sorry, I sound loud to myself without it up here. All right. Is that better? Sorry about that. Um, this slide just shows, um, sorry, backtrack a bit. The uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, undertook a road freight movement survey in 2013-2014. Um, it was the first survey of its kind since 2000-2001. Um, it was funded by the Commonwealth and the State and Territory Governments at a cost of uh, about $3 million. It covered about 16,000 um, heavy, heavy trucks um, and had a response rate of about 73% reported information for our 120,000 trips. 
Um, and these are the results sort of highlighted on, on a map. So this is the freight assigned uh, between regions. Um, so some of the highlights, you can see the importance of um, the um, Hume Highway, so it's practically the largest intercapital freight route in Australia. Um, also, the route between Sydney and Brisbane, so you've got freight going both by the coastal route and inland. Um, intercapital freight accounts for about 13% of total road freight. Sydney, Melbourne, about 4%. Sydney, Brisbane, about 2%. In terms of where um, our trucks are actually moving, we, from this data and some other data, on um, traffic volumes provided by uh, state and territory road agencies, we estimate that about 40% of heavy vehicle use is on the national land transport network. So they are all the links between the capital cities plus a few others. Um, and about 18% of, of cars are actually using um, that network as well. Uh, this slide just drills in a little bit, um, just shows road freight movements in the Sydney-Melbourne corridor. And I've got, um, I suppose the main graphic here uh, shows growth in road freight across the length of the corridor between 2001 in the red and 2013-14 in the blue. So um, Sydney-Melbourne origin destination road freight volumes were up um, by about 2.2 million tonnes over that period um, and total volumes in that corridor sorry, I'll give you a bit of feedback um, were about 12 million tonnes in 2013-14 Now the Sydney-Melbourne corridor is, uh, is one of the few that's actually shown growth over that period um, some of the other intercapital corridors, Melbourne-Brisbane in particular uh, but also Melbourne-Adelaide have um, not shown as much growth as as in as the city Melbourne project. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, so we've just got two snapshots of road freight movements. That's all we've got. So I'm just talking about growth between those two periods. Um, so that's sort of, that, I'll talk a little bit about what we're aiming to do later on in the presentation. Turning now to the, um, to the size of the total freight task, um, this graphic shows the size of the freight task split by transport mode uh, since 1971 out to 2013-14. Um, I suppose the key messages I've got on the left there so road freight volumes have grown almost eightfold in that in that time to over 200 billion tonne kilometres. So road is the blue. Uh, rail freight volumes have also grown almost eightfold, um, but most striking is really this is the mining boom. Um, well, particular sorry, I should say um, volumes grew through here, but here is the impact of the mining boom um, from uh, mid 2000s. And, uh, and there's probably um, actually more to come uh, this year, uh, 2000, oh, sorry, in 2014-15. Um, by contrast, um, total coastal shipping volumes have grown only slightly over that period, and more recently um, have started to decline, and that's really partly due to um, declining domestic oil production in this country, um, which is reducing the amount of coastal shipping of um, that trade around the coast, um, and also iron ore. So we had a few closures of domestic um, uh, steel making facilities, which has reduced the amount of iron ore being moved around the coast as well. Uh, and this slide really just highlights um, what's driving the growth in the overall uh, rail freight task. So on the left, uh, we've got the iron ore production um, since uh, 1960, uh, but you can see um, the rapid growth with the mining boom. And as I said, there's a there's another big whack in 2014 and 15. It wasn't shown on the previous slide to come. Similarly, um, coal exports have um, continued to grow uh, through this period. In 
In terms of where um, the road freight growth has occurred, uh, this slide just divides up the um, road freight growth uh, between um, freight carried in urban areas, or capital cities, I should say. So capital cities is the yellow. Uh, provincial urban centres is the blue. Uh, there's a slight change in definition just in this last point that I haven't been able to correct for. Um, and then the green and the, and the grey uh, freight carried outside um, uh, capital cities and, and uh, provincial uh, centres. So capital city road freight accounts for about 22% of total road freight in 2014. Um, and since 1976, um, capital city road freight volumes have increased or grown by over 300%, so 300% larger than they were back in 76. Uh, Non-urban road freight volumes um, comprise the majority of the rest, about 72% of total road freight volumes, and since 76, they've grown by about 500%. In terms of what vehicles are undertaking um, the freight task, I've got some slides here which um, on the left hand side it shows the share of the freight task carried by vehicles of different configurations. So um, it's a bit hard to read the, the legend, uh, but the yellow is the share of road freight carried by V doubles, and the grey is the share of road freight carried by. Um, triaxle trailer or six axle articulated trucks, and the blue is the share of freight carried by road trains, and then down below that, we've got some other smaller configurations. So you can see what's most interesting from this from this slide is really um, the introduction of V doubles in the um, in the early 90s. You can see their shares growing from you know practically nothing to to be the largest hauler of road freight in this country uh, by about when was that? mid 2000s. Since 2006 or thereabouts, uh, their share of the freight task has really remained more or less the same. Um, and you can also see, I suppose, that essentially you've had substitution from what was the word for six actual articulated trucks to be doubles over that period. Uh, we try and provide a bit of a measure of um, sort of productivity in the road freight sector, and I suppose one measure of that is the, the average load carried per um, kilometre moved by truck. So you can see over most of that sort of 40 year history, the average productivity of articulated trucks, this is articulated trucks as a group, has increased, well, really, um, what I say up here, it's um, doubled between 1971 and 2007. Since then, I suppose the average load carried across that uh, whole articulated truck fleet has stayed more or less the same. So that's really coming out of sort of that, that productivity growth that we are accounting for is coming out of this substitution to larger heavy vehicle classes. Um, so this is, I suppose, posing a bit of a message for uh, what the future might look like. Um, it's, uh, in my view, unlikely that you necessarily going to see uh, another boost to productivity as big as, you might, as we got out of B doubles. Um, uh, even with um, larger vehicle configurations that we're considering at the moment, B triples and the like, the area of the network that they might be able to access at the moment is much less than what B doubles were able to or are able to access. And the percentage sort of gain in, in um, um, additional freight on a B-triple over a B-double is smaller than what we got out of B-double over an articulated, or six actual articulated truck. But if the B-double was longer, there would be a productivity. Yes, <coughs> that's right, there would, there would. Um, I suppose that has implications for the number of vehicles on the road now. Admittedly, these, are, these numbers are based on registered trucks, um, so I don't have any information about trailers. So through that period where you had growth in the doubles, there might have been a consequent increase in the number of trailers on the road, but I don't have those numbers here. So you can sort of see through, um, between 1971 and 1991, the number of artic registered articulated trucks 
grew by about two and a two and a half percent per annum between 1991 and 2006. Sort of that that period where we had a boost in fee double numbers. That um, growth in registered articulated truck numbers was slightly depressed, about two percent per annum. But since 2006, we've had a, a large increase in the number of registered articulated trucks on the road. And to a lesser extent, that sort of growth borne out just with the number of bridge trucks. Um, but I haven't looked at that in as much detail. Is that trucks on the road or trucks sold? No, that's. Sorry, sorry that's trucks registered. So that's registered trucks on, or trucks on register. Yeah. In terms of. Um, what the future might look like. We have for a while now been projecting that the overall freight task will grow by about 80% over the next, or over the 20 years between 2010 and 2030. Um, road freight to grow by about 80% over that period. Rail freight by about 90%, but a lot hinges on really what China, what happens in China with iron ore. And coastal shipping, we're projecting, will grow only slowly, but again, a lot hinges on really um, what happens to Australia's domestic manufacturing, particularly heavy industry, in terms of aluminium, aluminium and, um, and steel. Um, and the other point to make, these projections are below um, what we've experienced in the past. So we're, we're projecting slower growth over the future than we've experienced over the past 30 years or so. Got some other slides here that um, a bit of a carryover from a previous presentation. I might just flip through them quickly. It just provides you a bit more context about the you know the nature of Australia's freight task. So the, this slide shows you um, a volume of of uh, import and export trade. So this is in tons. Again, I suppose highlights the importance of uh, the iron ore and coal ports around the coast in terms of pure volume. But in terms of value, um, I suppose Australia, Australia's largest ports, when you do it in value terms, um, the capital city ports um, come higher up the chain. Uh, oh, this really shows similar to what the last slide showed. Uh, we, um, a couple of years ago, we uh, published some projections of um, containerised trade through Australia's ports, so we projected that containerised trade um, would likely double over the next 20 years through Australia's main capital city ports, um, with growth in, um, in volumes through through um, Melbourne to grow by about 4.8% per annum, uh, Brisbane to grow fastest by about 6% per annum, and uh, Fremantle to grow by just under that. Um, we're also doing some work just to try and uh, fill in some gaps in what we know about where freight is moving. So we're doing a series of sort of commodity-based um, uh, freight movement exercises where we're taking information on um, that we know about where commodities are produced or mined in the case of iron ore, which is shown on the screen here and what we know about where they're exported, and then looking at uh, well, essentially inferring what the freight movements are across the network um, and uh, what that might mean for current and future infrastructure needs. So as I said, this slide just gives you a bit of a, a look at iron ore. Uh, this one, apologies for the resolution on this one, this one shows um, Australia's sort of coal freight supply chains for 2014-15 and uh, this slide here just provides a bit of a snapshot or a bit of a picture of um, sugar freight movements which we've also modelled and the picture here just shows um, cane sugar freight movements from essentially farms to mills. Um, there's some other components of that supply chain so essentially then there's the movement of the raw and refined uh, bulk sugar, molasses and other products. Um, so, 
I want to talk just a little bit about some work, um, as I mentioned, some work we're doing with the ABS to try and improve how we um, collect data or, or collect um, data on uh, particularly road freight movements more regularly and potentially more uh, cost effectively. So um, what we find is, uh, I mentioned that we've, we've had um, two snapshot surveys or freight movement surveys, one in 2001, one in 2013-14, um, really too far apart to provide us with reliable information about um, trend movements. Um, the surveys also impose a big impost on survey respondents. Um, through, the, um, through the last survey, we, or the ABS really um, came to the conclusion there must be a better way of collecting this information. And so we've commenced a project to um, try and source uh, or, or to test the um, um, utility of using information from in pickle telematics um, data uh, collected as part of you know, businesses' normal operations. Um, and we posed a couple of questions um, that we might that we thought we might be able to answer by um, through collecting this information. Um, we know it's done in the um, United States, so there. Um, the American Transport Research Institute actually has a collection of GPS data and they um, use that to produce a couple of outputs. One is um, sort of average corridor speeds across their interstate network. Um, the other is uh, they produce a report, I don't know whether anyone knows about this, um, they produce a report of the top 100 congested um, network locations for freight um, across the country. Uh, and this slide just shows an example of um, uh, the I-290 Circle Interchange in Chicago, which for quite a few years was coming up as the most congested network location for freight in the, in the US from the GPS data. Uh, and I think that stimulated essentially the federal government to put some work into um, analysing what can be done with that, that interchange. Um, and I've also heard anecdotally that um, uh, the mayor of Chicago also pushed hard for that work because he didn't like seeing this appear every year. Um, the part of his city was the most congested network location. Um, and this slide uh, shows the Kiwis are doing it too, so you know, that always raises the issue of you know, if the Kiwis can do it, why can't we? So we've been uh, we've been talking to um, industry. Um, uh, we commenced sort of uh, about this time last year with some some initial um, discussions with industry, and um, and there was sort of a favourable sort of response to cooperating with it. We um, then moved into a pilot study in February this year, and um, we've got. Approximately uh, 15 to 20 companies have provided us with data. I don't know the exact number of um, trucks it's covering. I know it's somewhere probably of the order of um, there's at least over 500 trucks that we've got access to, and the ABS has a bit more data, so it could be 500 to 1,000 trucks we've got in there at the moment. I know just from the um, the data we've got from three companies, we've got essentially five, you know, six million GPS point records. Um, that we're exploring at the moment. Um, and I suppose we've got this, in phase three, we've got operational from early 2017, but from what, what we're um, learning at the moment, I don't think it's going to be operational from early 2017. <coughs> this slide's just some early consultation. Um, I'll click over this, um, and I'll also click over, over this one. I oh, know I won't. Um, at the moment, we're doing the project, as I said, jointly with the ABS. Um, so we're getting industry cooperation to, to really analyse the data. For longer term, I think we're, <coughs> we in the, in the department are agnostic about how this, done, how this is done. So, as I showed before, in the US, it's actually collected by uh, private industry and made available to government for purposes of research and um, sort of informing policy. So that could be a way forward in this country as well. It doesn't have to be collected by government. It could be an industry-led collection. Um, I think, speaking from government, if it's an industry-led 
collection, we'd like to be able to obtain access to sort of um, anonymised or confidentialised information to help inform property. Um, some of the early results uh, we got from it, this is really just um, a sample of where trucks are stopping, so potentially provides us with a with an idea of whether we've got truck stops and rest stops in the right places um, and where we might need to put other ones. Um, and we have a um, heavy vehicle safety and productivity um, program that actually funds these rest stops. So this information could help us help inform or better inform our evaluation of that program. I don't know whether I can run this. Um, I'll leave this. This was a time lapse of vehicle movements across the network at five minute interval just from one of the samples. Um, I get some technical help. So we've got one truck that um, appears to have observations about 24 hours ahead of the others. Uh, and then a whole lot of observations appear on the on the slide, but that just gives you an idea of of the sort of rich detail you can get out of the GPS data. And the thing that we found striking about this particular data is it almost traces that that chart I showed you earlier uh, with the um, data from the freight movement survey about volumes across the network. Um, just from this sample of data, traces out a lot of that a lot of that network. This is another sample of, of data um, which uh, from, from the GPS records um, showing another aspect which might be um, helpful to inform policy. So at the moment um, there's uh, such a network or there's a, there's a network um, of key freight routes um, which are sort of determined as the, the appropriate places for freight on the network. So part of the key freight route is um, Golden Valley Highway up here, that way. Um, the GPS records are actually showing there's a large proportion of trucks that actually um, deviate from that network and go by Katamatite and then up, up that way. Now I'm told that that could be because there's a, there's a way station here. Um, but for us, it's, uh, we, we don't, um, uh, for us it's, uh, important to know this information so that we're actually funding the right network um, and not necessarily funding the wrong parts of the network. So the blue dots are heavy trucks and the green dots are the light trucks? No, no, sorry, I should <laughs> it, It's hard to read the legend. Um, the, the blue and the green is just uh, showing average speeds um, across the network. So, so they're actually going a lot faster along here than they are along here. <laughs> Now I should I should explain we're only using this data for statistics, you know looking at this data for statistical purposes. We're um, we're not actually looking at it for any sort of compliance or enforcement perspective. Um, uh, and I did hear at another forum someone someone from industry said something, and I don't know whether I get this right, um, that yeah everyone knows about the speedway or, or something. I don't know whether people in this room know about that. Yeah. Um, and this one just shows some, um, uh, we're also, we think uh, a lot of the congested network locations are going to be located around um, our major capital city ports and, and other uh, infrastructure serving those. Um, so this is really just a slide showing um, average speeds of, and volumes of trucks around Brisbane port from a small sample that we've got. So in fact, um, just this sample here suggests there's um, there's not a lot of congestion. So green is is um, is, is relatively uncongested. Uh, red is a bit more congested. Around here, there's a bit more. Well, trucks are moving a little bit slower. Um, I think I've already mentioned um, this. With uh, where we're at on this project at the moment, I said sort of phase two consult consultation is now complete. We've got 
yeah, somewhere between 15 and 20 companies who have supplied data. Um, and we're sort of really now into exploring the, the data and trying to produce some statistical outputs to go back to our key stakeholders with um, to, to really prove up whether this data will be able to provide provide useful input for, for both us in government and also potentially for the industry as well. Um, that was that was it. That was really thank you, Dad. <laughs> I was fascinated to learn that uh, this project is going on collecting data of GPS systems and trucks. Because this industry is coming grips with how to use this all this data how to turn it into something useful. But apart from the compliance question. That was uh, really useful. So, what information is coming back from the trucks? GPS, uh, speed, is there the potential for weight? Weight uh, Yeah, we're, um, I think, for this longer term, uh, we're definitely interested in. Yeah, longer term, we're interested in being able to use or source information about um, sort of, uh, the volume of freight. From electronic sources, but for this phase at the moment, we just we thought it was um, uh, going to be uh, less sensitive just to look at where the trucks are going. So at the moment, all we're getting from or asking providers in this um, pilot study is essentially the um, uh, longitude and latitude of the truck, um, timestamp, and the speed, um, and we're just using using that information. Um, anonymizing the truck and the, and the firm and uh, pooling it all together uh, to look at what, what it tells us in a statistical sense about where trucks are moving. Yeah. Sorry. In the future, do you think there would be a survey, like, you do a survey of what kind of freight being with? I know you had sugarcane, you the raw materials, the iron ore sugarcane. What about the processed materials, like say the liquid, um, refrigerated? Do you ever break it down to that, that sort of thing? Yeah, I've glossed over that sort of detail. The, um, the freight movement survey that was undertaken in 2013-14, it breaks down um, freight into approximately 20 categories. Yep. Um, so those, cate those categories are fairly broad, um, and they include um, uh, sort of an overall category of food, um, broke, which breaks down to something like um, cereals, um, beverages, and then processed food for human or animal consumption. And there's other things such as sand, stone, and gravel. I haven't got a slide on it, but but essentially, a lot of the the um, survey returns um, class freight as either um, general freight, um, so could be anything, or that the um, the survey respondent, whether that was uh, the vehicle owner, the vehicle driver, whoever it may be, um, did not know what was in the truck. So I think of the order of. Uh, if I say bigger, I'm probably wrong, but it's it's fairly significant. So around that twenty to thirty percent or more um, that's in those those catch-all categories. Um, so if I, I assume if we could tap into, um, you know, and this is something for the future, tap into uh, freight consignment systems, you might get more accurate information about the commodity. Um, but that's sort of a long way in the future. Follow-on question from that. The, the uh, framework we showed, the graphs that we showed, indicate that how significant the mining industry is for rail and post shipping. How significant is the mining industry for trucks? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think um, um, I'd have to take that one on notice, but it's, it's still uh, it's pretty important for some of the um, uh, local cartage. I know there's a, there's a couple of coal mines I think that are moving, moving coal by, by road short distances. Um, by far the most, I mean, one of the most significant tasks for road is actually cartage of uh, building materials. Um, so uh, a bulk, four leaf material. Um, yeah, stone, sandstone and gravel, essentially. Um, and, and it is 
in terms of total um, freight uplifted, it's the largest uh, part of the road freight task. But the average haul length of that stuff is about 20 kilometres or so. So in, in total ton kilometre terms, it's um, a much smaller share of the over, overall task. Yeah. We're good. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Oh, one more, sorry. James. Uh, I think the BRTR did a survey in 2009. I think, I think uh, your organisation did a survey back in 2009 10, which forecast the road freight cost to increase double or so in the next 20 years. Uh, your slide, I think, this time talks about an 80% increase <coughs> over that same period. So, have you updated your? Have, have I got that right? Have you updated your changed your forecast? Yeah, there's a bit of confusion out in the. I think there's a bit of confusion out in the sort of um, sort of uh, marketplace about our, our forecast. So, I think the doubling of the freight task was really um, around 20, 2000 to 2020. And since then, we've been projecting the freight task will continue to grow, but grow more slowly. Now, the factors driving that are really um, sort of project um, slower growth in GDP um, uh, coming out of really the intergenerational report. So we're using that as, as um, a key input in, in our future growth projections. Um, and uh, you know, underpinning that is sort of lower productivity and slightly slower population growth. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's. I know it gets quoted a lot that the freight task will double over twenty years, um, and often it was just over twenty years without it defining exactly what twenty years. So yeah, we're, we're definitely saying sort of projecting to eighty percent between twenty ten and twenty thirty, and then beyond that, probably slowing further in line with the um, slower projected growth in, in GDP uh, coming out of the longer term. Generational report projections. Thank you. Thank you, David. Great presentation.